And as long as we keep on outbidding each other, Google will encourage you to go top place bidding on that ad. And, and remember, I've got ad specialists that do it more than I do. I have that very high level. People I come across, they're, they're not limited on leads. They just don't do anything with them. Good afternoon, it's Kathy Millet from I'm Enough. Where did I'm Enough come from? And, and really, I think it's been a, a process of me consolidating information that I've received from young and parents. There's a bit of variation with how you're helping people depending on what they're trying to achieve. Is there one that you find that you're doing more? Like I find if I'm selling to businesses, most of them want money. land up in that sort of auction environment within that Google environment, but the other is really audience, interest, location-based. So I, I like to start every podcast kind of like a journey. Mm -hmm. So people are about to go on a journey and they want to know who the guide is, who's going to take them to the mountaintop. So how would you sort of encapsulate what you do or what you're doing or who you are, however you want to go about it? How would I encapsulate? Well... I'm a person that's been around for a little while. I have meandered across the path of starting way back with a degree in computer science. Oh, yeah. So I've got a very strong technical background, although admitted back in those days that I never wanted a program and I've stuck to that. It's possibly led me to a place of where I am today. So that very strong bend between marketing and tech um, I've been involved with some large tech projects in my time and it was about 13 years ago, 14 years ago that I identified social as possibly the new way of businesses being able to work in that social space. And my company's called Net Branding and people often say why is it called Net Branding and not social something or digital something. Well back in the day when I formed it the only thing I knew I was doing was branding people on the internet because digital marketing wasn't a phrase. Social media marketing wasn't even a term. It was this thing called Facebook created by a group of kids. And how was it even going to involve and support business? And at that point in time, many of my family were saying to me, listen, Kathy, I think you should go and get a real job. So net branding was formed way back. And ultimately, we've become a truly integrated digital marketing agency that we see today. But we're experienced base. We are really focused on our numbers and we're supported on building heart relationships with our clients so that we have a connection with the clients that we serve. Cool, you did well. There's a chaotic alarm in the background, but you just stay Good. focused. You, you've learned. I'm, I'm a mother. I've got kids. I learned to block out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can only focus one thing at a time, so I, I know it works. So, okay, net branding. What was it like when you first started? So, you know, you want to build this online presence for people, with, you know, cloggy, like coding. There wasn't really website builders, or how did you go about it? So, you know, way back. Obviously, the initial websites were coded as websites. Mm. Um, and I'm talking when Microsoft was starting to come to the fore. So I can remember when Google first was coined as a phrase. Um, in terms of when I was starting to work with that, I really saw websites as an end to visibility. It was a method to get news out, content out, as you're really familiar with. And obviously, WordPress has always sat in that environment. So WordPress was a tool to be able to get content out and if you actually go back to my website and I urge everyone not to do it you will see some of my content from 2011 2012 and mostly they were pieces of content that were only a paragraph long because that was all you needed back back then to get visibility for what you were trying to achieve we know that that's not the way today from a social perspective and let's go into the Facebook environment because from memory it was Twitter and then Facebook came to the fore so from Facebook's perspective, businesses did not exist on Facebook. So some of my very first clients still have a personal profile and a professional profile because it was the professional profile that we worked to become the business profile. And obviously as Facebook business pages evolved, then they got business pages. But it was clunky, but we made it work. But at that stage, every single thing you did 
got visibility because there weren't any shareholders with any of these major corporations that were demanding profitability. And we see that today. You don't get visibility unless you actually are paying for visibility. Yeah, I'm always interested in underpriced attention. You know, where can you go where you can get the mass exposure for the least cost? And uh, it seems to be, you know, the places where people are uncomfortable to go or it's too much of a change for them and it's not that mm-hmm. well supported and, you you know, you're kind of like forging through the forest. Was was there were a moment, like I remember Gary Vaynerchuk talking about like 90% of people were opening his emails, now you might get 20 30% and like people were just buying. Like when you first got into the Facebook round, was it just like, you know, you could you're just killing it like if like you got in the ads and people just buying in a very cost effective way and so that i think there was exposure in a very cost effective way because if you remember the likes of um yellow were very big so the yellow pages and it was an ad in the yellow pages was x amount whereas you could actually achieve reach in a location and a neighborhood with a very low cost and look you, there's still opportunities on the internet today you know, they're, they're still ranking opportunities. I think you've just got to know how to go about it and understand that no matter what you do, it does need effort. And if you're not doing it yourself, obviously that requires a spend related to that. But I still think that at the end of the day, when you've got SEO versus paid acquisition of traffic, I would always be trying to reduce my paid acquisition of traffic and actually building up Hmm. my ranking so that uh, that stands for the long haul. But it's not, um, my my turn of phrase is jelly. It's not jelly. It's not set and forget in the fridge. It's about constantly working towards it. I don't know if that's answered your question, but I think there's still opportunities in that environment. And branding can very easily sustain you long term. Yeah, I mean, uh, since you when I started this, I, I didn't know anything about content or videos. I didn't mm-hmm. have any money for marketing, so I just made lots of content. Nothing happened for two years, but then the phone just started ringing, mm-hmm. so then you didn't have to pay. And I think that's always the balance is like keeping the lights on while also knowing brands the most effective way. Mm-hmm. It's like balancing those two things. So when you talk to a client, you're like, okay, we're going to do this brand play. We're going to do a bit of SEO. It will happen in maybe six months to a year. You might start seeing something favorable mm. if you do a good job. How do you navigate the keeping the lights on and brand? Oh, and, and it's really hard. You know, we're busy with a client at the moment that we've um, released a social strategy for them. We've released, and in, in, in their particular case, we've done ads. But again, we don't only do ads. Before we launched the ads, we made sure that the web page was opportunistic for a conversion. We made sure we had tracking, we had tagging, we had whatever we needed to place to manage those ads. And in the last the last days, I can see that those ads, which have been on since Friday, so Friday, what, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, we, Tuesday, to four days, have generated 700 hits on his website. And those people have been there for a long time. They've been there for a minute, they've been there for three minutes, they've been there for four minutes. That to me is an active campaign that is actually generating interest because otherwise they wouldn't have stayed there for that length of time. And he's already saying, you know, where's the leads? But it all takes fine tuning and it all takes extra effort to keep those lights on. And this is digital whilst people think that we live in an instant society an instant world it still needs diligence activity intention to get the results Hmm. i'll give you an example i have a process that i i work to and often my team will question it but i had a lead from somebody who i've repeatedly marketed to for three years and when they were in the right space that's when they came forward so if I turned the lights out after a year that effort would have been wasted Hmm. so on that like I mean there's a book called the ultimate sales strategy or ultimate sales machine I think it's called and it was um a guy that used to work with Charlie Munger, so mm-hmm. like a billionaire that had this advertising agency, and all he did was ignore everyone else and just focus on the highest spenders of advertisers. 
and nothing happened for six months and he doubled his sales year on year. Mm-hmm. And one of those things is being specific and, and, and going more in depth on each individual and not giving up. So how do you manage either the nurturing of a lead so that you're still front of mind, but in a way that's not necessarily drawing on a massive time? Or were you were you calling them? Were you talking to them? Were you retargeting that one email address? What, what, what do you mean what you're doing for three years? Well, there are multiple things that you could be doing. So you could be doing a combination of those. So it could be repeatedly sending them a newsletter. It could then be they've clicked on the newsletter, come through to your website, and then you are going to retarget them for a little while. Um, It could be the subsequent newsletter. It could be that from that newsletter, you've directed them through to Facebook. And in Facebook, they re-engage with a piece of content, which means your content is coming back up. It could mean that they've engaged with you on LinkedIn. They've seen something on LinkedIn. And so because they've engaged with that, it's repeat. There are multiple touch points that you can have. In this particular one, I know it was a newsletter I do, but it could be multiple other touch points that will allow people to re-engage with your content or ultimately even say, well, she's still around. Because think about it. How often have you not in your own home environment had a plumber out? And the plumber comes to your house and you're really impressed with this plumber's services. But three years down the line or four years down the line when you now need a washer in your tap and you don't know how to do it, you've forgotten who that plumber was if they haven't connected with you on a regular basis. Mm. How how do you manage the, like, let's say someone's got a specific problem-solving company, you know, plumbing. How, how does a, a plumber still add value in a non-confronting way? So it's like, I, I might not want to learn about pipes. Mm-hmm. I might not want to know how to unclog my toilet every week. What, what, what's, um, is it just you're constantly retargeting? Is it you're doing the newsletter? Is it there's a different kind of value you could provide? There's always value you can provide in any business. So it might not be I don't want to unclog my loo every week, but I'm going into winter as an example. And as I go into winter, what's happening in winter? We've got a lot of leaves. We've had a lot of flooding. We've got drains blocked. It could be as simple as, you know, secure your home. We're going into winter. We know that it's a rainy season. Make sure your gutters are working. Here's a quick ch- a tip to check if your gutters are actually flushing what they need to. Um, have you checked your roof? And by the way, this is how you do it. Um, have you ensured all the drains around your home and in front of your home are clear? So... So there's always value add. There's always value add irrespective of what industry you're in. So what are your thoughts on, like, so let's say you had a personal brand and you have all these unique aspects to your life and you share these different components and that's engaging universally, Mm -hmm. so to speak, or certain avatars that appeal to your style of content. Is that another avenue as well? So you have multiple plumbers that are sharing their experiences and their learnings that's also being incorporated into a newsletter instead of it being like problem orientated, it's more relationship orientated and learning? Well, you could take a newsletter and you can look at the pillars of content. So, um, you know, you might want to send a letter newsletter out, but you might want employer of the month, if that's what you're referring to. And it might be some employer of the month because they did X, Y, Z and they've been identified as a star employee. Alternatively, in that same one, you might find somebody's got a new puppy and you might want to highlight that. So you can actually, in terms of the content, have a variety of content or have various members of your team write that content or support that content or share that content or share something that's of interest to them. Okay. Yeah, I was sort of meaning the Gary Vaynerchuk model. Like, So he's essentially... You heard of Gary Vaynerchuk, I imagine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, he, so obviously he does talks a little bit about advertising, but a lot of what he's focused on is belief breaking, you know, like perspective, patience, all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And that has a universal appeal that filters down to a call to action that might appeal to the, you know, Fortune 100 companies because, you know, they're seeing this large scale audience he's attracting. They're getting value from him as a human as opposed to the thing he does. Because mm-hmm. I always find that tricky is especially in service, it's an intangible thing. And if you're selling the how instead of selling the likelihood of success, you know, like social proof. So mm-hmm. you like have all the examples of the success that people have had from your services. But any time I get into the how, it just sounds like work. It sounds confusing. Mm-hmm. sounds overwhelming. But by the same token, let's go as a, a little bit of a um, 
a questioning of that approach. Yeah, go on. So how you many, can challenge me. How many times don't you get, oh, we're the best digital agency in, in New Zealand and we'll get you ranking in the first page of Google and I guarantee you the results. And, you know, I see it all the time. I see I see the salesman using the value add so-called proposition and yet the results at the end are not there. You know, the value that you've got for that service is not there. There's very little tangible about that approach. So let's come back to the plumber. I can see in the plumber the value that they bring. What value will a plumber bring to you? The value the plumber will bring is that your house won't flood and that you'll have nice hot water and you'll have good running water to be able to have your cup of tea at night or your hot cup of Milo. That's the value, if that's what you're referring to, that the plumber will bring. Oh, is that a question? Ask, is I'm that what I meant? You. Yeah, I, I, I was meaning, essentially, I was meaning, you you know, you're making this content that's valuable and you're building a relationship around it. You're not, like, if you if you brag to someone, if I say, hey, I'm the best ever, I'm like, I don't believe you. Mm-hmm. Whereas if someone, everyone you meet, just like, oh, you know, Ryan's is really good at this certain thing. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, how does it work? Oh, you can tell you about it. So it's it's the social proof is they're landing on a website and you've got the average of your clients. On average, they make $2,212 per week after the first 60 days. Mm-hmm. And then it's just a wall of social proof. You don't say you do it. Mm-hmm. They say it for you. Let's go to what I was getting at. And, and at the end of the day, because everyone is so different, your value of a term of sale could be $2 per sale. So I could have generated 4,000 leads to you. You know, that's worth $4,000. When somebody else looks at it, they're not seeing the value. I think the value comes when you've got an understanding that you are generating leads. You're generating conversions. Because once, if you're looking at it from a digital perspective... You're sitting in a financial advisory position. I can generate a lead to your business. I can generate the phone to call, the the phone to ring, sorry. What I don't believe I can quote on is what you do with that. And I certainly can't quote how you handle that call. So I'm a little bit loath to join the American style of marketing, mm. which says, you know, I'll generate 600,000 more dollars of business because every cost of sale is different. Every cost of lead is different or value of lead is different. And every search is different. So looking for an insurance broker, there might only be 50 or 60 searches. Whereas looking for a nice red dress, we're looking at two, 3,000 searches. So it's, it's horses for courses. I think at the end of the day, what you're wanting is website traffic. Website traffic that's there for the long haul. Website traffic that's being funneled to the places that they need to. And once they've been funneled to the place, they will make the decision as to whether they want to be acquired or not so, so your focus is around the traffic like i'm going to bring this amount of people mm. to your website because i can quantify that and there's less variables and i can watch when i hand the baton to you yeah okay well on that so so i've been going deep diving into facebook ads only for a few weeks so mm-hmm. obviously no expert um and there's a few main campaigns i'm not saying this to you because you, you know this it's just more for the people listening is you know, a campaign objective, the algorithms got very good at putting content in front of people that are likely to make that decision of that campaign objective. So it might be sales, Mm -hmm. it might be leads, Mm -hmm. it might be traffic, it might be awareness. And I was listening to a guy that um, he was making, he was selling a product every 20 seconds. And he believed in e-commerce, if you're doing traffic and awareness, it's it's a waste of money. Mm Mm-hmm. And he just uses conversion. Mm-hmm. So, are you when you're doing the Facebook ad campaign? Are you driving? Are you doing traffic? Are you doing a conversion event? Are you what depends sort? Depends of? on the strategy. Oh, yeah, okay. So, if the clients are new business, yeah, 
then you're possibly going to be doing awareness. Okay. If you're busy in the midst of a SEO campaign, you're also looking at other elements. You might want traffic to go to the website, but mostly we will be looking at a conversion. But a targeted conversion, not m measured through, I very seldom measure them. Well, we do measure them through Facebook, but often through the analytics at the back end. So everything is honed in on the particular desire of that particular business. Mm. So at the end of the day, you're looking at What's the best way to get leads? The best way to get leads is when there's an awareness of the brand. They've hit the search. They're looking at those top search results. They see a brand in those top search results that triggers a I've heard of you before. Immediately, they become a warmer lead because they connect with the brand. From there, you can drive them through to the website and, and they do what they need to do. So it sounds like there's a bit of variation with how you're helping people depending on what they're trying to achieve. Is there one that you find that you're doing more? Like I find if I'm selling to businesses, most of them want money. Mm -hmm. You know, they might say, oh, I want to make a difference. <laughs> and that's true. It happens. It doesn't seem to happen too much. And then the other one is like, oh, I want more time. You know, I want freedom so I can do the things I want in life. Mm -hmm. And then that still comes down to money. Do you have enough money to hire the person that can mm -hmm. replace you? So uh, are you finding a particular type of client you're seeing a lot or a particular objective you're doing a lot? A lot of my clients want the phone to ring. Oh, yeah, okay. So it's about, and we track that down to call monitoring. We know if the call has been answered, if the call, you know, what's been, what's been going on. So a lot of people want the phone to ring. They, or they want the lead to come through the website. So they're wanting that inquiry that comes through that's detailed enough so that they can actually take action on it. They're wanting that call to, the phone to ring so that they can pick up the call and then actually do the conversion on the phone because often they find that that's the best way of doing the conversion and in the e-commerce environment obviously they're funneling through to actually the acquisition of the item at the end yeah cool because yeah I, I find you know even to see this podcasting example like only one percent of people make it to the 27th episode like they give up mm -hmm. and i imagine you know a lot of clients or people i come across they're, they're not limited on leads they just don't do anything with them so so I guess is that where you went more of the brand play where they're familiar so they're going to call them and they're like, oh, this is glorious. I don't have to do anything. Or what led to the... I, again, I think it's very similar to the strategy. I've never looked at what my competitors are doing. I do what I know works for my clients mm. and what keeps my clients with me. Um, I also do what when my... You know, there's a, a certain smile on my face when I actually get a call from a client going, we've got more work than we can handle. Because then I know that one, they're keeping me on because we're delivering what we need to do. But also they've actually got now got a workflow that they're producing to and that they're performing against. Um, the other thing that is always a, a smile when I've had people come to me and say to me, I want to thank you, Kathy. And I go, for what? I mean, obviously, I'm working for them. And they go, because if it wasn't for you, you've changed my business. And I wouldn't have a business right now if it wasn't for the new funnel of leads. And they possibly don't use the word funnel, but for the new flow of leads that I'm getting because of what we've done. That's good. Yeah. That's all you want. Yeah, you don't want them to have no business. It's not great. Do, do you, um, are you finding... Uh, certain things are working quite well. So from what I've heard, if you do a Facebook lead campaign for, say, a service company, you give something away for free and you have an instant form that goes to a booking tool or to a website because that way it's very minimal friction for people. They use an instant form. They just put their name, the number, it's already saved, and it comes through to you. Mm -hmm. Or what are you finding is quite a, an effective strategy? Like are you doing like TikTok? Are you trying Pinterest? Are you doing LinkedIn? Are you just doing search? Because it's intent-based, but then obviously it's very expensive. What are you finding? Um, across the board, I'm trying to think. Often that Facebook form is a really non confrontational so the facebook campaign that leads to a form is yeah. is quite a good a good way um some of my clients work really well with forms on their website so you've driven them to the website and they fill the form in and away they go um the thing that i'm i question again there you go is <laughs> I don't mind being questioned. No, and, and I'm not questioning you. I often question it myself. 
And I think that's why when I choose to go and educate myself and I try and educate myself regularly and each year, I often will not will refrain from heading to America because I think the American market is based on a very hard level of funnel strategy, funneling people to a place and pushing them out the other side. I think in the New Zealand environment and the, the demographic that we service, it's a very different demographic. And I think that the hard push to gather as much detail, sometimes people don't want that. So the thing that I like doing is giving them an instant result. So yes, they'll give your email address or yes, they'll give something. So they know they're going to be remarketed to, but they also know that they can pull out of that if they want. But, you know, give them something without having to sign their life away in terms of big form fills. That's possibly the best value. Okay, so how, how do you balance the them seeing it valuable? Like let's say it's an application. So they, they're applying for the opportunity to do something so then that gives the illusion it's more valuable compared to convenience do you do you have a dance between those two or or you're always like hey let's get them to do the little least amount as possible and the least breach of privacy i think again it depends on where the value sits so if it's a brand new piece of software that you're saying here's an opportunity for you to try it out maybe you know, the techos will see that as a huge value and they will easily subscribe to that because they'd want to see this new bit of technology. Whereas on the other side, if it's somebody who's time poor, doesn't want to be interfered with, has a particular need for the piece of information that's behind it or thinks it will be of value, then try and keep it as easy as possible. Hmm. Do you, do you ever think about, like, there's a guy coming on the scene, and I've talked about him every podcast the last 15, <laughs> um, Alex Amosi, and that's the American thing. So, once again, yeah. I don't know from a practical standpoint because I'm not doing it. Do you, do you ever think, he, he's he's got a book called $100 Million Offers, mm-hmm. and his whole thing is make an irresistible offer people feel stupid saying no to. So, do you ever think about that? So, you might have the best creative known to man, mm-hmm. and it's exceptional. And you got all the retargeting, you got the conversion piece, but the offer's ugly. It's not sexy, you know. Do you ever sit down with the client and think, how can we have like a, a high front end offer that soaks up the ad spend and makes us, you know, people think, really excited? So let's come back to let's come back to Kiwi. Yeah. So I'm at home, my toilet's blocked. <laughs> yeah. All I want is to find a plumber that is going to be responsive that I need almost immediately because I've got the in-laws coming to dinner and I can't have this scenario. That's all I'm wanting. I'm not interested in the funnel. I'm not interested in the lead. I just have this need to have my toilet unblocked. Let's go into the insurance environment. We're going to the insurance environment. Yes, we could think about nurturing an email list about certain giveaways or certain support about you know, what you need to be thinking about, what the hurt is in that insurance environment. And it could be something as simple as, I wish I knew that I could have claimed on my insurance at at this point in time. But you know, the broker that I used didn't advise me, but this particular broker has advised me and there was actually a claim that could be made. So go through your policy. Here are the points that you need to check. It could be any form of intro to get people to actually go, well, that person seems to care and that person has a difference. It could also be that lead magnet, that lead giveaway, that PDF. So again, it's story for story, place for place. And it's not always about that lead magnet to give them an offer so that they can take it away and sell to them later. Mm. Because I ask you, how many of those things that you've opted into because you've got a fan dangled PDF have you actually read? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not a good example because <laughs> I, I read them all, but but I get why people, they, they, they can't be bothered, don't want to read it, they get sent this thing and then have bad experience because they're bombarded. Or alternatively, it goes into the I will read it next week. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and one of our clients, it's as simple as they come in, they 
have an inquiry because they've got a need. Mm. They go through from the page that they're inquired on to a thank you page with a video from the business Mm. thanking them for making the inquiry and confirming that somebody will be back in touch with them. Mm. Now, that is a far more settling connection to the brand than thrusting them down a funnel. Yeah. But again, there are businesses where we do create intentional funnel collection of emails. So where are we going to with the conversation? Because you and I can go backwards and forwards around which way to go. Mm. And I think it's really about looking at the business, looking at the business need, looking at the hurt of the client and do they need something instantly or is it a long ch- long tail nurturing process? And then working through that nurturing process and see how you can coerce and connect with those people in a meaningful way so that your brand becomes a memorable brand and when they have the need and they're possibly doing a search or they possibly then recall your brand, they're back in the mix with you. Hmm. Yeah, I, I'm asking these questions to challenge my viewpoint as well, so it's not it's not combative. Oh, and, and you know, and I, I think that it is always the, and, and, you know, at one point in time, something may work. And that's hmm. the interesting thing about the digital environment. The digital environment is an environment where the only real things that you can control is the content and how your website's made up. Mm. What you can't control is the LinkedIn algorithm. What you can't control is the YouTube algorithm. What you can't control is the, and the list can go on, of the things that you can't control. So at the end of the day, you can only control what you can control. And at any point in time, what you do today and you attempt to replicate tomorrow may not have the same output. Mm. Makes sense because I've saw I've seen sort of like a change. Like, I'm just gonna have some tea. Yeah, have some tea. Go hard. <laughs> so I, I've seen before a bit of the skill set in advertising was the targeting because you know you had to know a little bit about this, a little bit about that. How do you put it in front of the right people? And now the algorithm's getting very smart, and it seems almost like it's creative led. I call it like the TikTokification of social media. Where once upon a time it was like, you know, the social graph, like how many people follow my Instagram and uh, do they like me and how does it work? So they get surfed up my content a little bit more. Now, TikTok appears to show me what I'm interested in. Um, So if the algorithm is very good at showing people what they're interested in, does that therefore mean that, you know, the creative becomes more important than targeting because the targeting at the moment, excluding if you have like a guitar pick, Like, Mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to just sell it to anyone because they need a guitar. Mm -hmm. So if you have like a creative-led approach and you just tick a button, like conversion, optimize it for the AI to just pick broad and find things that work with that interest content as well as people that will take that action. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing a change with that? Like, are you thinking about creative-led advertising? Oh, look, at the end of the day, it's, it's a lot more about the video. And a lot more about the creativity around that. So, we, you know, we get that. You just only have to look at the value of a reel versus the value of a post, the value of a story versus the value of a post, and how long they actually combine and, and, and live because they all live a different different life within those environments. But there's still some content that and some subject matters that people might not want to see on TikTok. Mm. So... Again, where was I going to with that? The thing that I was thinking about as you were talking about TikTok was that very quickly you can have one slight deviation from what you're interested in and it can take you a whole week to try and recover the course back to the content that you actually enjoyed seeing. So the thing that you started off was use the AI and let the platform decide where your ads are going to go to. Yeah. So again, in that environment, 
Kathy likes to be specific. Kathy likes to actually have facts, figures, control, monitoring, and know what is going to happen. Because maybe it's the cynic in me. <laughs> but the cynic in me will be saying, if I hand over all my budget to a place that is responsible for shareholders' interests, will I actually get the best value and optimization of my ad? If we look at how Google has gone and Google Ads Management has gone. One of the things that Google is trying to get you to do is to throw your ads wide open. They've removed some of the match criteria that will allow you to really hone in on the ideal search that you want. And they're trying to really make sure that you have very broad match. Broad match is an absolute waste of your money. <laughs> so at the end of the day, I'd rather control and not use all the I'll give them the free reign to decide where best to place my ad. And I do try and manage it myself. So on that, what sort of changes would you do like an on audience segmentation? Like do you, is that where you control it so you can know where it, things are happening or what's your, cause I, I get like the shareholder components, like on one hand they want you to spend more money. So they that, also want to retain you. So. Yeah. So mm. then they also want you to have results, but yeah. do they want you to have too much results where you don't need them anymore? So yeah, that's a good point there. Well, I mean, I'll give you an example. So on one of our clients, we were, we've been doing work with them for a long time and we have a very close relationship in terms of what their cost per acquisition is. And we could see that their clicks, we started off with clicks that were about a dollar, two dollars. And we saw them climb. And at one point in time, there was a large chain that came to the party and we just saw them skyrocket because the chain was always going to outbid whoever was there to get top place performance. And so those clicks went up to $70, $80 a click. Mm. That's a huge jump. What we've been able to do through careful strategies, we've been able to optimize those campaigns and we brought those campaign, campaign clicks back down to that $11, $12 mark. Now, we haven't done that through giving full control back mm. to the platform. We've done that because we carefully manage and we optimize the back end of those campaigns. Can, can you explain a little bit? Because, you know, a lot of people might not be going all in on the Facebook part. Like, what do you mean by auction? You know what I'm saying? Like, so, you know, people might not, oh, is this a digital auction or is everyone just yeah. coming in? And <laughs> so perhaps not so much in the in the Facebook environment because Facebook would be audience driven. Let's cover the two bases. Oh, yeah, so in a Facebook environment, the typical way that you would approach things is you approach things based on a location and you say, I want my ad to show to anyone in this location. Alternatively, you would position an ad on, I want my ad to show to people that have a certain interest or alternatively, you could do age segments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can actually divide up your ads by location or audience. Then you can choose what you want them to do with the ads. You can choose them to actually take an action, which could be a click through to a website. The action could be a conversion on a form, or the action could be an engagement with your content that you're sharing. So that is typically your Facebook environment. As we go into the Google environment, the Google environment is very search intent. So your ad will display, and I'm not talking about display ads, I'm talking about search ads. Your ad displays based on a search. And so if everyone is looking for, and let's just use the word again, the plumber, because we've covered the plumber a few times. And <laughs> so yeah. we're looking for the plumber and we're sitting in the CBD because that's where you offer. So somebody's looking for the plumber in, in a, the CBD area. Yeah. If that's the search phrase that we're looking for, well, then you'd want your ad to come up. You don't want a plumber in Christchurch coming up when you're looking for a plumber in the CBD. Now, how many plumbers would serve as the CBD? You give me an idea. It's just... I imagine a fair few, maybe... 50, 60, yeah, maybe? Yeah. So we've got 50, 60 plumbers. It's not all of them will want to be on the... You know, will be advertising because some will say, I've got enough work. But, you know, we could have 20 or 30 plumbers at any point in time wanting to appear for that search term, plumber in the CBD. Now we get into the auction scenario. How much are you prepared to pay for a lead based on a search term that's positive 
to your business versus how much am I prepared to pay? Hmm. And as long as we keep on outbidding each other, because Google will force you, not force you, Google will encourage you to go top placed bidding on that ad. And remember, I've got ad specialists that do it more than I do. I have that very high level, high level understanding. But very quickly, you can be in a bidding war and you can just be playing topsy-turvy and going one above one another. Mm. So you land up in that sort of auction environment within that Google environment, but the other is really audience, interest, location-based. So what are your thoughts on those different strategies? So like a lot of people I see gravitate towards the intent because, you know, there's less thinking. Well, there's a lot of thinking still, but like they're more likely to get some tangible thing quickly. They don't have to make this beautiful picture or like video on Facebook or something. What are your thoughts on the different platforms and, and, and how someone could use that as like a framework to decide how should I go about this? Should I, my audience are here or I'm not that good at creative, so I should think about this or really good at keyword optimization? It comes down to that initial discovery. Where is your website currently? Is it converting? Isn't it converting? Hmm. What's happening? What is your ranking? What is your visibility? How close are you towards actually being found for the words you want? Do you need SEO? You don't want to do SEO? Well, maybe we need to do ads. Maybe those are search ads. Are you a new business? Are you an old business? Um, are you an existing business? Do you have a network? Do you want to only do remarketing and bring people back? It really is that discussion with that client base around that strategy of, of where they currently are, where's that baseline, and then what are the plug and play bits that you want to bring into the mix moving forward? And often I find with clients, you know, while we've got many clients at the moment running social campaigns, mostly social is around brand. But by the same token, you've got an event. You're running an event. You want people at your event where you're going to place that event. You're possibly going to place that event where people will be enticed to attend the event when they're not absolutely searching for it. No one actually goes out and goes, I think I want to attend the cultural art exhibition down at the viaduct. That's possibly come to them through advertising promotion, and they possibly are more likely to have seen it through a social channel. Mm. So that sort of environment, obviously you're going to be utilizing Facebook. Yeah. It's or just, other social platforms. Whatever makes sense for mm. you. That's actually how I got the job here. I started running Facebook ads for events because I want to learn about money. Mm -hmm. So I thought if I get an audience, then I'll, I'll just um, make friends with the speakers. So I just call them up. Hey, mm -hmm. do you want to be a speaker? And then he's like, do you want a job? I'm like, okay. So four <laughs> years of being advice. <laughs> so you yeah. But, you know, having all of that can be worked through. And those are discussions that either the business owner can do themselves, or the company director and the board will make some decisions as to what strategy they, they want to to go or what path they want to go down but perhaps also to take the conversation to some other areas so the other areas can be what are the things that you control we've already said the things that you control in those environments are your website the things you don't control are your social platforms so how many times have I not been involved with recovery of social accounts because you know you Ryan you've joined the business somebody gives you the Facebook page um, you're happy as Larry in the business. Everyone thinks you're the best employee since sliced bread. But a year and a half down the line, things turn. And off you go, and no one remembers that you're the only person that has access to the Facebook page. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. And there could be a grievance thrown into the mix. Yeah. So how do you navigate that? How do you manage the risk associated with allowing external parties access to what is your assets. But more than that, ensuring that those assets are protected because one of the biggest things at the moment, and we saw it in the Herald, is the corruption and the compromise and the um, security breaches on Facebook pages. And we also know that Facebook's not the easiest to deal with <laughs> when it comes to accounts that have been lost or compromised. Yeah, And I've seen some pretty interesting attacks 
and compromises over the last year. You know, I've seen the ransom. I've seen threatening family and friends on your Facebook page to show them you're watching porn when they've never actually watched porn in their life. (laughs) But they've infiltrated into the page and they're actually sending people messages from their own friend profile in the page. Um, You know, I've seen lost accounts. I've seen we've recovered accounts for clients. Um, So you've got that environment. What's my advice? If anyone wants some piece of one piece of advice from me, is ensure you've got all sorts of two-factor authentication over those accounts, and anyone that's in those accounts has two-factor authentication. And do not, under any circumstances, have that two-factor authentication going back to your email account, because mm. if you're sitting in a Gmail account, that's possibly also got somebody with beady eyes watching over it. Hmm. So the two-factor authentication comes through, the hacker's in there, they see the code, and away they go, and they've got full access. So what's best practice on that? So you, you maybe mobile or phone, and then also what sort of user permissions? Let's say you're taking on an agency like you, or mm-hmm. you're taking a new employee. What should you think about to risk manage? So risk management in that environment is keep your control of the Facebook account in the house mm. um, only give out rules and partnership arrangements with other other parties and ensure any party that has any access to it has two-factor authentication in it hmm. so when you say roles like i think there's like admin and content manager or something yeah. and partnerships is partnerships like is it so easy i would to get be a partner of, so partners like so if you get an agency they should be a partner mm-hmm. not like because if they're admin they could kick you off or something oh they it depends on the the agency so i suppose they could but i would yeah i'd add them in as a partner so partner but they would need full access to all your assets because i can't do my job if i don't have access to the meta the the business manager account you know i need access to a variety of levels so also you know the one situation we had last last week was a particular gentleman who thought he had two-factor authentication on his account I don't believe he had, or if he had, it was an email back into his own email address. That was compromised. So they got through that, they got into the Meta account, and Mm. interesting, the thing that they often do is something that you don't notice is, I mean, my name's Kathy Millett. So they might actually put a Kathy Millett profile that looks exactly like my name in that account, and you don't actually notice it because you know that that profile's actually meant to be in there. Yeah. And... The one thing we noticed when we were clearing out and sorting his account and try- and recovering it, which we did, was that he didn't have two-factor authentication pushed to every profile on those accounts. So that's one area that I'd give some tips in, you know, actually make sure that you've got some good strategy and good control over those environments. The other one is your website. If you've got your website and largely WordPress, not so much your Shopify platforms, but largely WordPress, because WordPress is open source, one, make sure that you're keeping it up to date. Two, make sure that you're doing due diligence and keeping good backups. And three, don't rely on your hosting backups. Why do I say that? Well, I imagine if something goes wrong, then you're cooked. Well, often I believe, my opinion and my experience is that when somebody's going to compromise a website, they come and lay the open door policy and what needs to happen a few weeks before they actually strike. So if you think of what the typical lifespan is of a hosted backup, you possibly only have a week, maximum 30 days of backup. What's the first thing people do? They go, we'll roll back to when it wasn't compromised. So they roll back a week. The hole's still there. The hacker comes back and is more determined. If they keep on playing that game, I've seen companies get to the stage where their emails are compromised because the emails are marked as spam generating emails and suddenly companies can't send emails. Hmm. So again, you know, make sure you've got a competent outfit supporting you if you are compromised and your website has been corrupted or is generating spam to unworthy sites. It's quite an art. Um, Because, you know, like if you hadn't laid that out for me, like, for example, I might try and create like a a website myself and use a, you know, a theme Mm. and pump it out. And now it's done. 
and I'll just get some hosting thing. And you don't really think about like, you know, NZX was, they were compromised. They essentially, all these uh, attacks of sorts where they're just getting an overwhelming amount of information the system couldn't handle. Oh, that's a denial of attack. Denial of attack. Yeah, oh, so what little... that, that really means is there are so many hits on the website that based on the bandwidth that that website can cope with, it's unable to service the request. Hmm. So in other words, you're giving a request to the website, I'm giving a request, next one's giving a request, and the website gets so confused that, well, the hosting gets so confused that it really doesn't know who to serve and what to serve to who, and then it just lies flat and says give me a cup of tea and wake me up when I'm feeling better. <laughs> mm, mm. I mean, you got some good examples. So what are, what are the things that happen to websites and like different things like that or someone clicks a link and that compromises their organization? And So um, local business was, obviously the website was corrupted. The developer kept on, it was actually quite, and let me go back to it because I actually changed text, but same same thing. Local business, website was corrupted. Developer said, I'll put the backup in place. It was fine for less than 24 hours and boom, it went again. I'll put the backup in place. Bang, it was fine. So we got in, we recovered the website, but they had left enough space that there was still some rogue file sitting there and it went down again my security specialist said that that was possibly one of the most elaborate hacks that they he'd seen it took us five days to get it back but the reason it took us five days to get it back was because by the stage that it had got to when we got it the website from the back end was sending out spam to numerous email addresses and had been stopped by some of the antivirus and anti-spamming software. So we had been marked as a spam site across the globe through various content managing and filtering pieces of software. Oof. Not pretty. Mm -mm. Interesting. Well, we've done, we've done 51 minutes. Um, so I guess like a an ending point whether it's just an organization thinking about these sort of things and how they should protect themselves mm. or what they should think of from a advertising component and then who should find you and where they find you so the one thing we haven't spoken about is and then i'll answer the who they can find and how they can find is living in this environment for as long as we have or i have surrounding myself with close team members that are with me today that are experts in their area but yet acknowledging the value that we've spoken about and perhaps debated a little bit that digital <laughs> can give mm. the fact that it's a have to have tool in most of our toolboxes if we run a business today but yet actually looking at the impact that it can have on business and it was interesting that overnight there was a, a lot of release around Lush and Lush actually removing themselves off some of these social platforms because of the harm that social can bring. <laughs> and that's something that I've spoken to for a long time. In fact, I've authored a book called The Hidden Pandemic Surviving Social Media, protecting our young people in this environment where we see a lot of digital addiction and digital um, men related mental health. So, you know, by the same token as what we've spoken for 51 minutes, as you said, around the benefits, strategies, ways to approach things, ways to protect yourself, um, you know, there's also another side to digital. And one thing I would urge anyone that is listening to this that possibly has a child is to have conversations with those children rather than absolve yourself from the conversation whilst you might not know how TikTok works you might not know how to get a reel up you might not know how to navigate through a Facebook page and you might need to call a young person and they will laugh at you at the end of the day you've got life advice so always open the conversation to your young people and say no matter where you are no matter what you've done no matter how you're feeling I'm here for you because often as parents, we resolve ourselves from that environment and we don't extend that helping hand into that environment. So start the conversation. Where can you find me? 
You can find me at Net Branding, so it's N E T B R A N D I N G dot co dot N Z, or if you were in America, dot N Z. Um, my tagline should be pretty findable because it's Net Branding, be seen, be heard, be found online, and that's exactly what we do. We're Auckland based, but we service businesses from. You know, in New Zealand, we service businesses in Australia. We service service businesses in some of the eastern countries, um, or the Asian countries. We service businesses in Africa. Um, so we've got a very wide range of of clients that we support. Cool, boom, boom. <laughs> and if you're wanting to see my charity, my charity is called I'm Enough. I'm Enough dot co, which supports young people in the digital environment, believing that they are enough. Well, um, I will have both of those in the description. And uh, thank you for coming on. My pleasure.